So where we left off last time was talking about the managed blocker interface, and I described what the managed blocker interface was, which is really simple. It's just got two methods in it. And uh, I talked briefly about how the common fork join pool framework uses managed blocker in order to be able to compensate for blocking threads by adding additional threads to the pool dynamically and then scaling them back when they're not needed anymore. What we're going to do now is we're going to talk about how to apply the managed blocker interface. And we'll talk about a really helpful little class called blocking task that makes it easy to apply. So it's not quite as crufty as it would otherwise be. So there's a bunch of examples from the Java documentation of managed blocker. And uh, if you take a look at the managed blocker website, you'll see these examples there. And I'll just kind of walk through them. The first one is something called a managed locker, which is a funny little pun on managed blocker. And the intent of this is to be able to handle blocking synchronizers. So something like a, a mutex or a rentrant lock. The way this works is that the constructor is passed a reentrant lock, which it then turns around and stashes away in a local field. The isReleasable method, this is the one that's called to see if it can acquire the resource without having to block, which is good. If you don't have to block, then there's no need to create more threads. So in this particular case, the managed locker isReleasable method tries to acquire the lock. This is a little beyond the scope of this class. We'll talk more about it next semester. But in a nutshell, this is an attempt to try to acquire the lock. And try lock will return the, um, will return a Boolean that indicates if the lock was acquired without blocking, in which case we got it, we're done, we don't have to block. But if it is unable to acquire the lock because someone else is already holding it, then it'll return false. So if it turns out that is releasable returns false instead of true, then we're going to have to call the block method, or rather the framework. We'll have to call the, uh, the block method. And uh, what that'll do is that will go ahead and call the lock method. And again, we'll talk more about this later, but when we talk next semester, but lock basically will block waiting to get the lock. So try lock, tries to get it. If it gets it, great, returns true. If it doesn't, returns false. In contrast, lock actually waits patiently to get the lock. And that, of course, could block. And it could block for some period of time. So if it blocks, then in that particular case, it will end up causing the common fork join pool to create another thread because it's compensating for the fact that this one is locked for the duration of time it requires to get the lock. OK, here's another approach. This is called the queue taker. So queue taker also implements managed blocker, and its purpose is to handle a blocking queue. And again, this is a little bit beyond the scope of this course, but it's pretty straightforward. I'll explain it quickly. Uh, so essentially, the, the queue taker constructor stashes away the blocking queue that's passed in in a local field. The isReleasable method here tries to get an item from the queue without blocking. So there's a couple of different methods that are used on blocking queues. One of them is, is uh, basically um, take. And take will block until the queue is not empty. So if the queue is empty, it'll block. Poll, in contrast, will attempt to get the item. And if it's there, it gets it. If it's not there, it will just return null right away. So it's a non-blocking take, if you will. Poll is a non-blocking take. So if we're lucky and we get an item, we're done. No need to block. No need to create any more threads. If we're unlucky, then we'll have to have the framework called block. And what we do here is we're going to have take called on the queue. And take will block until an item is available on the queue. And then the final method here is just a little convenience method called get item. This will return the item that we took here. And that way, you can get the result after the manage block method completes. And that's, that's of course, what's being used under the hood to, to sort of trigger all of this stuff. So when you call manage block, you'll pass in this queue taker object. And when that returns, we can get the result. So that's an example of using 
the Manage Blocker interface. What I'm going to do now is talk about a convenience class that I'll go through in some detail that helps make it even easier to use Manage Blocker. And this is really, really pretty cool. So this particular example, you can see here at this link. And uh, you can play around with it. It's called Blocking Task. And it basically allows you to use a Java 8 supplier. Remember, supplier is a functional interface that is used to get a result. And we use suppliers with the common fork join pool. So here's how this works. There's a, a method here that's called call in manage blocker. And it enables the use of blocking suppliers in conjunction with the common Java uh, fork join pool, or the Java common fork join thread pool, whatever you want to say. Um, and there are pros and cons with this approach. If you take a look at this Stack Overflow article that talks about the pros and cons, I think it's a really cool approach because uh, it, it encapsulates all the low-level stuff and wraps it all up. So you can just pass in a supplier, and it'll work magically with the, uh, the fork join pool's manage blocker mechanism. So here's what we do. We, we take in a supplier, as you can see up here. And this supplier that's passed as a parameter is wrapped up in a helper object called supplier manage blocker. We'll look at supplier manage blocker in a second. So we end up with this manage blocker variable. And then this call and manage blocker method calls down to the fork join pools manage block method, which is a static method, which only works with the common fork join pool. And it passes in this manage blocker variable that we created here to wrap up the supplier. And this then will go and do all the magic things we've been talking about. That will uh, check to see if this thing needs to block. We'll see how that works in a second based on the methods that are provide, provided by the manage blocker object. And if it needs to block, it'll go ahead and create an extra thread in the pool so it compensates for the fact that blocking is taking place. And then the last thing we do here, we just get the result. So after this call returns, get result will give the result back. OK, so let's take a look at supplier manage blocker, which as you can see is a private static class nested inside of blocking task. And this is the thing that encapsulates a supplier to work with the common fork join pool. So supplier manage blocker implements fork join pool manage blocker. And it's got a bunch of little fields here that we'll take a look at here in a second as well. So you can see that the constructor for manage supplier manage blocker takes a supplier. And it's going to go ahead and stash that into this private final field. And then, oh, and then there's also a couple other things. There's a Boolean that keeps track of whether we're done. And there's something that keeps track of the result that's obtained once we've gotten the results from the operation that's going to block or may block. Here is the block method. As you can see, what block does is it goes ahead and calls the get method on the supplier. So remember, supplier is passed in here as a parameter. And if we go back here, we can see that it's what's passed in as the parameter to call in manage blocker. So the supplier is whatever the user supplies, literally. And we simply say msupplier.get. And the get method is going to block, um, or it ought to block. <laughs> if, it's, if it doesn't block, there's no point in using the uh, the manage blocker for all this stuff. So it's going to go ahead and call the get method here. And when it's finished, it'll set done to true and return true. There is no try operation. There's no you know see if you can do it in a non-blocking way with this approach. So uh, is releasable just going to return whether we're done or not. And that's just a flag that's got set up here. And it starts out to being false, as you can see. OK, so once we go through here, with uh, the final method is get result, and it just returns the supplier's result. And this, of course, is intended to be called after the manage block method returns. So as you go back here for a second and see where this is called, the get result method is called after manage block returns from the fork join pool. OK, so that's basically the, 
sequence of things. So now let's take a look at how to use this abstraction. So we built a little helper class called blocking tasks. It's got a method called call in manage blocker. And if you take a look at the EX20 example in my GitHub repository, you'll see that this particular example uses blocking task to ensure there are enough threads in the common fork join thread pool for the case where we're actually downloading something from the network. So now you've seen three different examples of blocking. One example of blocking was blocking with locks, like a reentrant lock, and how you could use a managed blocker for that. The other example was using blocking queues. We saw how to do a managed blocker for blocking queues. And the third thing here is demonstrating how to use managed blocker for downloading things that could take a while. Obviously, downloading a large image at a certain URL could take a while to run. So that's, that's the context of this example. And this is actually very much like your program that you've been doing. Um, if you look deep in the bowels of the code, I think you'll find this down there somewhere. So blocking download is a method that takes a URL and transforms it into an image by downloading the image and then doing some, some stuff to convert the, the bytes into an image. Here is blocking task call and manage blocker. So this is the call we just looked at. And notice what we do here is we pass in a lambda expression that will call the download image method, which is just a an image it's just a method that downloads an image, um, and will block with the given URL. So this becomes the supplier that's passed to call and manage blocker. And call and manage blocker will then arrange to call back to this supplier lambda, which will download the image, when it gets to that point after it's gone ahead and um, done the, the manage block call, passing in that little supplier manage blocker local variable that we created. And this method, of course, call and manage blocker, because it used the manage block method, will ensure that the common fork join pool is expanded to handle the blocking image download. So that's really cool. It's really convenient. You can use good old Java 8 features like Lambda expressions and so on. And then you wrap everything up with this helper class that makes it really convenient to, to program these things properly. The other thing, as we mentioned before, about using this approach with uh, the managed blocker is that the extra threads in the pool will be automatically terminated when they're not used for a while. So the, the thread pool, the common fork join pool, figures this out. There's some internal setting that says, nobody's used this thread in the, the last minute. Let's, let's shut it down. The only downside with this approach, with using a managed blocker, is that it becomes possible to saturate the CPU cores during bursty workloads. So if you have, let's say you had a server that was downloading files, and all of a sudden somebody came along and had hundreds or thousands of files that you, they had to download, this particular approach would just keep spawning new threads to compensate for all the blocking, and you could end up really sort of pegging the CPU. Um, is that a problem? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's not a problem. Maybe you just have to peg the CPU, and uh, it'll obviously at some point you know, settle down, but you could end up spawning a lot of threads in the pool. So there would be ways you might sort of put a, a bound on that if you wanted to, but that's not built into this example. OK, so that's a nice example of how to apply the managed blocker interface. I hope that gives you a better sense of how this stuff works. It's, it's really super cool and allows you to use blocking operations with the common fork join pool, which otherwise was kind of designed for CPU bound operations, but having the ability to compensate with the managed blocker gives you a wider range of things you can use it for.